Amos is uh, uh, really a very interesting character. Not, not too much said about him, but we can gather uh, things about him because of where he's from and how he described himself. And he, he's described very succinctly as to what he is. He's a keeper of sheep. He's probably an owner of sheep. Probably, uh, he, he, I wouldn't call him a, um, a destitute man at all because he apparently owned these sheep. These are high-valued sheep, produced a very fine wool. And he also was a dresser of these sycamore trees, a cultivator, if you will, of these sycamore trees, which is kind of a kind of a fig tree. I think there are sycamore trees in the United States, but they're not they're not the same. They're a different kind of uh, tree. He uh, was he especially uh, suitable for the task that was assigned to him being a you know he's kind of a we would kind of call him a rough person because of the lifestyle that he led it, it was a very hard uh, existence that he led the area that he cared for sheep <clears throat> was no garden of Eden it was very uh, rough terrain and very little vegetation. It was a hard scrabble life for anyone that tried to make a living out of that area around Tekoa. They call it the wilderness. Tekoa is about uh, 12 miles south of Jerusalem. And I think Bethlehem is about halfway between Jerusalem and Tekoa. But he, that's going north. But going east, about 12 miles, 18 miles, something like that, was the uh, Dead Sea. And if you ever seen pictures, if you have Bible maps, you can look at the terrain there, and it's, it's very rough. And it's a hard existence. And it has an effect on a man that tries to make a living out of something like that. But apparently he did... Uh, well enough for himself. And he's probably was real travel too. You know, one thing about, it's interesting about the book of Amos is, even though he was a, we may call him a sheep herder, or, uh, you know, you go back, the same words that used to describe him and some of the other books and, and the way that it's described as a, a sheep owner. And I don't, I don't think anybody at that time, a single person had large flocks. It was, it was too hard of an existence to uh, have a large flock. But that uh, wool was so valuable that uh, whoever had that wool wanted to get the best price for it. So they traveled around. They, they wouldn't just go to Jerusalem or you know some of the surrounding towns. They, he may have... Uh, going up to Bethany and all sorts of places to find the best price for his wool. So that would make him a uh, man of travels. He'd been around. And uh, you look at the uh, language of uh, Amos, and it's very well written. And if you look at the uh, what, what they call the philological uh, aspects of Amos, and that's that just means the language itself. It indicates something about the person that actually is writing that. And it indicates that he he pretty much uh, was well educated. And uh, where he received his education, we don't know. Don't know when he was born. Don't know exactly when he uh, engaged in this prophesying. We don't know how old he was when he did go up to Israel. We don't know what happened to him as a result of preaching to Israel. But uh, again, 
when he was called by God and told to go prophesy to Israel, he did it. There was no questioning. You know, as an example of uh, uh, Jonah, Jonah fought it, but not Amos. When he was told to go, he went. So he has certain characteristics, uh, character traits that we that are you know, good for us to emulate. He was a very simple man. We know that just from what he was. Uh, he was going to go to a very sophisticated environment of Israel. And that may be one of the reasons that he was chosen to go there because people then, you know, we talked about uh, don't look at one's appearance, don't make a judgment on the basis of his appearance. If he had gone there in fine clothing, what have you, with the message that he was going to deliver, it may have been dismissed outright. It, you know, who knows? But I think that lent credibility to what he was going to say by his manner of dress. He's just a very simple individual, just natural. He was just what he was. And that way the people could listen to his message and not him. And he was a very stern individual. Now we'll be going through the uh, 12 books of the Minor Prophets, but there are other prophets too. And none of them was as harsh and stern as was Amos. He was, like I said, uh, Amos, he didn't care what your feelings were. Your feelings didn't matter. The message mattered. He was hard. He was severe. He was rigorous. And I've always said that uh, you know, when you deal with these prophets, yes, there is condemnation. And Amos was certainly noted for his proclamation of doom, just as Jonah was when he finally got Jonah to do it. But I said there's always, always, there's always hope, too. And we, when we get to the very end of uh, Amos, we'll see that there is also hope offered to the people. But he, he was very direct. He, uh, as we like to say, he, he told you how the cow ate the cabbage. There was no doubt about you know, what his position was. So that was a, a character trait that lent itself to the message that he had to deliver. He was very, he had a very keen mind. You can re see that from uh, his writings. Um, now he's going to be, uh, he had to engage his audience in such a way that they would actually listen to what he had to say. And he had to say, what he had to say had to uh, garner their attention, grasp their attention. Nobody could doubt from listening to his message that he didn't know what he was talking about or that he was highly intelligent. It was, it was very obvious that he had a keen mind and a very deep understanding of what he was saying. Another character trait of uh, Amos, that he was very uh, observant. He was a realist. You know, he was not a dreamer. He didn't come up with these fantastic uh, solutions to anything. He was not an introspective uh, mystic. He dealt in the objective things, concrete things, uh, realism of the world. He had, had an outstanding breadth of vision and insight of what was going on during that time. Like I said, because yeah, maybe because of his travels uh, in the uh, wool trade, that he had a knowledge of what was going on around him in the uh, world, because he's going to be dealing with a number of different nations. And he knew about the basic problems that, uh, which were made possible from very 
penetrating observations of the places he visited. Even though he was in a very remote uh, location, he knew what was going on around him. He was a very dynamic individual. He was very blunt, uh, but there's a certain dynamic appeal which came from his uh, clear and incisive way of speaking and, and writing. He was also a very courageous individual. Now keep in mind he's from, uh, he probably considered himself a citizen of Judah since he was below uh, Jerusalem, 12 miles below Jerusalem. And, but he was going to Israel. And Israel and Judah, you know, they had their love-hate relationship. Sometimes they loved each other, sometimes they didn't. But he was going, let's just say he was going into enemy territory. So he was no coward. He, he, uh, he did not fear any man. He did not fear any prince or priest. It's interesting to note that he never went to Jerusalem to seek their counsel as to what he should do when he went to Israel. He didn't seek counsel from the, the king there in Jerusalem or any priest there, what have you. So he you know, had to be a very courageous man to do that. And he was a man of uncompromising principle. Whatever his convictions were, he stuck by them. When he was told to quit prophesying, he wouldn't do it. He had a very strict and rigid approach to morals, and he'd adhere to them without uh, waving one way or the other. People may have, uh, you know, when he went to Israel, who, who knows how they considered him. They, given their immorality and depravity, they may have considered him to be uh, prudish or puritanical. Don't really know. Now, keep in mind that uh, the area around Tekoa is a vast wasteland. I'm trying to think of somewhere in the U.S. that would be comparable to uh, the area around Tekoa and you may get some of the uh, southwestern deserts that might be uh, comparable. You know, I always talk about West Texas or Odessa. And I think Odessa is, is a garden spot compared to around Tekoa, but you get out in some of those places in West Texas and you know, Arizona and some places like that, or west, western, southwestern California, you can be pretty bleak. And that might give you an indication of what Tacoa was like. Very little vegetation, limestone hills. It was a tough place to make a living. And I can say that uh, the uh, the fact that he came from such a foreboding place provided uh, provided him with a backbone that could not be bent. And he had a devotion to God. And a lot of people that that are in those situations, uh, they're not distracted by material wealth. So he had a devotion to God that was necessary for him to complete his task. He was told, and if you go to the 7th chapter, verse 15, he was told to go prophesy to my people Israel. And he accepted this charge without question. It's very likely that he'd made uh, previous journeys to Israel. Like I say, he was a shepherd. He had very um, 
valuable wool. Being a good businessman, he would have gone to the place where it would have uh, commanded the best prices. So he, you know, he he could be uh, that he was well traveled around in that area, and all those little countries around him, those there were six nations that were uh, condemned around that area, and it's very likely that he had been to those places too in his uh, wool trade, wherever the prices uh, were the best. So he'd been around. <clears throat> Another indication that he's been around for a while is that he made mention of almost 40 different cities in, in Amos. So he had some knowledge of those cities around about him. So he, he was a, a traveled man. And in addition to uh, obedience to the summons of God, he went to Bethel. Now that was kind of like the Jerusalem for... Uh, the nation of Israel, the Samaritan nation. So he went there. That's where they had all the uh, temples, all the uh, idol worship. Uh, they apparently, at least out of appearances, they were very religious people because they had all these different festivals and what have you. So that would have been an opportunity when they had the people together to do this uh, preaching. Now, like I said, he he uh, was uh, uh, began his uh, mission, if you will, during the reign of Uzzah of uh, Judah and Rehoboam the second of Israel. And uh, Rehoboam II may have been towards the end of his life at that point in time. But during this time, as I said before, there was a period of peace that allowed uh, Israel and, and Judah to some extent to extend their uh, territory. Assyria was at a, a low point. They had weak kings and they had oppression from other nations around about them, so they were kind of in a weak position. So Israel and Judah took advantage of that and extended their territory. There's a period about, during this time, a period about uh, roughly 60 years where there was peace. That's very unusual in that area to have peace. But there was a period where there was about 60 years where they had peace and when there's peace, usually, when there's peace, usually, there's prosperity. And in this case, there was prosperity in Israel. And it was uh, a conspicuous prosperity. Or cons I should say that the consumption of material wealth by the wealthy was conspicuous and the uh, Disparity with the poor was also quite conspicuous. So anyway, um, that was the time that uh, uh, Amos went to Israel, and it was uh, this interregnum period was one of peace, but it was just a peace before the storm, because in Assyria when Tiglath Pileser the second came to power. He, he was a strong king of Assyria, and he began his conquest, and he eventually uh, uh, conquered uh, Assyria, and he also conquered uh, Israel and took them away captive. So it was a good time for uh, uh, Amos to go to, to Israel to preach, to get them to repent. And I think he knew that he was not going to get them to repent, or well, they didn't. But he did offer hope. There was a period of hope. And since it was a time to repent, it's a time to quit, too. <laughs> so, so we'll take this up again uh, next week.